In this video, we'll be looking at how Christians in the past, during the 18th, 19th centuries, uh, were used by the Lord to bring liberty to slaves in the slave trade. Um, now, you've got to remember that the Americans and uh, the Europeans were, were doing this uh, for probably uh, well over 250 years ago. But within a relatively short time, a small group of Christians turned the slavery law around. And it's not to say also that, you know, before the African slave trade, there was <coughs> trading of, of white slaves. Um, mostly these slaves were enslaved because of their financial situations and mostly because of their religious uh, associations as well. Most of them were Christians. So uh, let's have a look at uh, let's have a look at this the abolition of the slave trade. Christian Consciousness, this is from the JubileeCenter.org, which, uh, you know, I've had a look online, and this is probably, you know, I wanted one from a, perhaps a perspective of one of the Christians, um, this is quite a broad, broad-based article, she got the year 2007 marks the 200th anniversary, <coughs> excuse me, of the abolition of the slave trade by the British Parliament. So, again, we got a seven in there. People think that that's uh, the number of the, was it the sun god? What about the number of the son of God? You know, seven means perfection, completion, liberty, loads of different things, right? Uh, the campaign for abolition was spearheaded by devout Christians and it stands to this day as perhaps the finest political achievement of what would now be called the faith-based activism. Now look, look what's happening with Islam today coming across enslaving white children in Britain, in Europe, in America uh, for their slave trade where, whereby they're sold as uh, prostitutes and used within these countries. It's not as if they have to go and trade with other countries, but the British people themselves and uh, Europeans and wherever Islam is, there is slavery. It doesn't bring liberation. It brings slavery. It brings death. Is there such a movement in Islam to stop uh, Islamic slavery as there was in the, the Christian nations, the pre-Christian nations as they, as they were before? They're not Christian anymore, of course. You could argue they're more just satanic now. Uh, hallelujah. So, the paper examines the Christian mind of the ab abolitionists and ponders the lesson for today. Sorry about, sorry about that. Introduction. May 22nd, 1787. Twelve devout men assembled at a printing shop in the city of London. Most were Quakers, but they were joined by several Anglicans, including the veteran anti-slavery campaigner Granville Sharp and the young Thomas Clarkson, who would devote his entire life to the cause. The twelve established themselves as the committee for the abolition of the slave trade, and they recruited the young Yorkshire MP William Wilberforce, to lead the campaign in the House of Commons. A charming, well-connected, eloquent and evangelical Wilberforce proved an inspired choice. He and his closest allies were fired with godly zeal for a righteous cause and buoyed by an enormous swell of support from across the British Isles. Just like what uh, Tommy Roberts is getting a lot of support in, from the British Isles and everyone actually, but that knows who he is. Even from certain Muslims, even from certain Muslims he's getting support. Ones that are not radical. The cause was promoted in a flood of publications, sermons, pamphlets, uh, treatises, what is that, treatises, poems, 
I'm not sure what that is. Narratives, newspaper articles, reports and petitions. Within 20 years of the seminal meeting in the printing shop, the slave trade had been abolished. So they, they did it for 20 years. 20 years. You know, it's not that long. Uh, and Britain led the abolition of the slave trade. And after they abolished the slave trade, they went after, even militarily, they went after other nations who were trading slaves and in some cases successfully stopped slave trade. And this, is, this was like the, the British Navy at that time. And I know the, the British military haven't got the, the best uh, record in the world when it comes to you know, liberty and stuff like that, but they did do something good. So I, I just got to point that out. Uh, in 1833, after the greatest mass petitioning campaign in British history, Parliament abolished slavery itself in British dominions. Five years later, in 1838, the slaves were finally emancipated. By the 1880s, slavery had been extinguished in the su southern United States and across most of the earth. Now, when I visited uh, Fateyville in North Carolina, I believe there was a Scotsman who went and he he uh, campaigned and successfully campaigned against the slave trade in Fateyville. And I preached the gospel there in Fateyville Square about, uh, I think it was about two, 2007. I'm not sure, yeah, it was about 2007. So, wow. So, so the Lord actually brought me to America in 2007. I didn't even realize that. When it was 200 years from the abolition of the slave trade. Wow, I didn't even, I just realised that. And uh, we had a nice, uh, we preached the gospel there and, you know, got a few toots from people. <laughs> people come up and spoke to us. Um, hallelujah. From any historical perspective writes the preeminent history of slavery, David Brian Davis, this was stupendous, a stupendous transformation, absolutely. <clears throat> Can you imagine something s similar happening today? That if Muslims got on board with uh, stopping sexual slavery and stopping uh, other types of slavery, by the way, within their religion, do you think uh, there'd be success? You can but try, but where the Spirit of the Lord is, there there is liber liberty. So, the rise of Christian abolitionism, British slave trading had begun in the late 16th century and grew apace during the 17th and 18th centuries. By 1807, around 3 million slaves had been transported to the Americas on British ships. The trade was occasionally denounced by Christians. Richard Baxter declared that slave traders were fitter to be called devils than Christians. And the Puritan Samuel Sewell published America's first anti-slavery tract, <clears throat> The Selling of Joseph. And, you know, this is what the, the West Africans say. You know, I've got, I've got a lot of good friends in West Africa, and they liken it to, you know, the selling of their, 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 their brothers to America, and it's like Joseph, that these people have become rulers and kings and priests and prophets. So it's, it's quite a romantic way of looking at it. Um... Also, hallelujah. <clears throat> uh, praise God, we'll keep reading. But most Christians in the early 18th century accepted slavery as a fact of life. Um, the evangelist George Whitfield deplored the cruelty of slave owners in American South but did not condemn slavery itself. Indeed, he owned over 50 slaves in Georgia. The Anglican evangelical John Newton was converted while campaigning a slave ship in the 1750s, but he did not speak out against the trade until decades later. Anglican Society for the Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts owned many slaves in the Caribbean. Uh, then there's a lot of white slaves in the Caribbean as well, originally from Britain, Scotland and all that, these places. The fact the word society was branded on their chests with a red hot iron to identify them as property of the SPG. 
For most Britons, the brutality of the slave trade was out of sight, out of mind. British slave traders were carrying almost 40,000 slaves from Africa to the New World every single year. Yet there was no public outcry. Uh, certainly, you know, Holland were involved in it. And most of these ships, by the way, were owned by Jewish traders. They were owned by Jewish traders. But the fact is that uh, to actually trade anything, you got to go through the Vatican. So that's another thing you got to realize. And then the other thing you got to realize is that, you know, the Christians who got involved in it, um, which, uh, you know, if, 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 you, if you were an anti-slaver back in uh, the 1800s, and your own minister owned uh, dozens of slaves. You know, try try being a good Christian then. You know, you, you'd have had to form your own movement, had to, you know, form your own church. It would have been very, very difficult. Um, because there, 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 there was a political atmosphere that, you know, this they were trying to justify this. They were trying to say, well, you know, slavery's taught of in the Bible. It's funny how the same Christians, you know, they will say that uh, the law's done away and yet they'll start quoting Bible verses from the Torah about slavery. Again, this is the, the hypocrisy that the Lord is talking about. The great hypocrisy in the church that the Lord is talking about. <clears throat> well, let's continue. Only gradually from the mid 18th century on, onwards did the Christian abolitionist movement take shape. It began with American Quakers as a perf perfectionist sect, the Quakers be believed that the true Christianity would be countercultural. but by the 1730s many owned slaves. Three remarkable figures, Benjamin Lay, John Woolman and Anthony Benzett, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> refused to accept, <coughs> sorry, refused to accept this state of affairs. So, Tenacious were they in challenging their brethren that in 1754 the Philadelphia Quakers officially renounced that practice of slave holding. Slavery was also coming under attack from Enlightenment philosophers like uh, Montesquieu and Rousseau, but it was Christian activists who uh, initiated and organized an abolitionist movement. So good on Christianity. The Protestant movement was still had a bit of life in it by that time. You know, it was relatively new from about the 1600s, the, Pro the Protestant movement. But the zeal would have been still there enough in, you know, the 17, 1800s for, for some action to be taken against those who are captive. Because, you know, Yeshua said, I come to set at liberty the captive. Hallelujah. There where the gospel is preached, there is liberty. There where the Spirit of God is, there is freedom. Hallelujah. Freedom from sin, freedom from oppression. Hallelujah. So from the 1860s, the Anglican Evangelical Granville Sharp campaigned with some success in the, the courts on behalf of vulnerable black Britons. And it's just amazing that uh, this, the slave trade had gone on with white people for such a long time. And it wasn't until really, you know, the African slave trade, that Christians began to form groups and do something. So uh, that's quite amazing. Probably because all the good Christians had, had become slaves in Britain by that time. They'd just been jailed and then taken over in ships. And we can look, look at further videos about uh, the slave trade from Ireland and Scotland in a future video. Maybe I'll make that next. It's very, very interesting. In the Somerset case of 1772, Lord Mansfield ruled that once in Britain, slaves could not be compelled to return to the colonies. By the 1770s, evangelicals were waking up to the seriousness of the issue inspired by Benezet and Sharp and the British Methodist John Wesley, American Presbyterian Benjamin Rush denounced the slave trade in influential pamphlets. Increasingly, the horrors of this traffic in human beings were being exposed to public view. The most notorious atrocity involved this, the slave ship Zong, whose captain had th thrown 130 slaves overboard in order to claim insurance for their deaths. And I know that these Africans could not swim, they cannot swim. <clears throat> 
once the, the British Abolition Committee, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> once the abolition, <coughs> excuse me, once the British Abolition Committee was established in 1787, abolitionism quickly became a mass movement. In 1788 to 92, there was a media blitz and petitioning campaign tied to coincide with Wilberforce parliamentary bills. So you see how like Britain was involved in, you know, uh, respectful things back then, not just how to uh, kill their own, you know, kill and destroy their own population, turn a blind eye to children being raped and, and uh, basically just becoming slaves, just turn a blind eye to it. You know, back in these days, the, the, you know, the, there was uh, righteous things happening in that, in that country. Thomas Clarkson had worked tirelessly to assemble damning evidence against the trade and abolitionists pioneered many of the tactics of modern pressure groups, logos petitions, rallies, books, tour, tours, posters, letters to MPs, national organization with local chapters and mass mobilization of grassroots agitation. Hallelujah. There were even boycotts of consumer goods as up to 400,000 Britons stopped buying the rum and sugar that came from the slave plantations in the Caribbean. Wow. That, that must have been hard, especially the, the rum and from the Caribbean. I think that was a really popular popular product. But, uh, well, they had the uh, fasting capacity to stop, fast from doing wickedness. That's the, the fast that the Lord requires. Requires means that you got to do it. So, so they did it. So what about the, the fast today that the Lord requires? Will you do it? Will you stop supporting uh, jihadist uh, individuals and businesses and organizations? It's up to you. Um, in a sermon to his fellow Methodist, Samuel Bradburn argued, urged them to join the boycott and recalled that hundreds of Manchester Methodists had signed a petition against the slave trade in the chapel at the communion table on the Lord's Day. I guarantee it wasn't the Lord's Day, but anyway. But it was a good day. <laughs> Hallelujah. Every day is the potential to be a good day for the Lord if we uh, put aside our worldly things and focus on the Lord. In just one generation, there had been a sea change in Christian attitudes on both sides of the Atlantic. Thirty years ago, wrote American Jonathan Edwards, Jr., Scarcely a man in the country thought either the slave trade or the slavery of Negroes to be wrong, because this this obviously was racism. Where did that come from? You know, I think racism is a sort of a naturally inherited thing, but by that time they had just discovered certain parts of Africa, and this this was just a new thing to them. His own father, the famous theologian and revivalist Jonathan Edwards Sr., had owned slaves, but the practice could no longer be excused. Our pious fathers wrote the younger Edwards lived in a time of ignorance which John winked at, sorry, God winked at, but now he, now he commands all men everywhere to repent. So you can guarantee, I mean, see, if, if you keep slaves, if you kept slaves, and, and say, well, the Bible supports that. See, the Bible supports uh, taking someone in and you you know uh, a human being right and you can train them up for seven years <clears throat> in other words this is, you show them the work to do in fact you educate them for seven years <clears throat> it's, it's almost like an apprenticeship the slavery in, in the bible that the bible talks about is like an apprenticeship and after the seven years the apprentice or the, the so called slave has a chance of going off now, if, if you get a kind slave owner, then and, and, and that slave owner has been, been quite generous and kind to his slaves and not mistreated them, then you could then they might actually give them something. They may actually say this I know I shouldn't I know I shouldn't I don't need to do it, but here's <coughs> here here's some money and all the things that you've been taught in the past seven years, you can go and get a job, but meanwhile here's some money which which can pay for your uh pay for a house or an apartment for the next year, you know, until you get settled down, until you find a job. That was the, the, the ideal of slavery in the Bible. It was, it was taking people who had nothing 
who had no financial background, just literally off the street, taking them in and saying, look, you know, I, this, this is going to be your job, X, Y, and Z. Will you agree to it? Uh, if they said yes, you put a piece of wood through one of their ears, I think it was. This is in the Bible. And it says that after the seven years, if the slave have been treated well, then they can choose to stay on in that household and serve that household, or they can choose to leave. But do you think the Christians, or the, anyone for that matter, Catholics, Jews, actually observed that seven-year law? No, they were mistreating them. They were mistreating them. They were uh, being bad to them. They were doing wicked things to them. You know? So I just want to point that out. You know, they talk, people saw the Bible supports slavery. No, well, okay, it says slavery, but what it really means is like, uh, you know, it's like taking someone in and giving them an apprenticeship in life. You're teaching them the culture, you're teaching them the Bible, you're teaching them the, what, how to cook food, what clothes to wear, what... Uh, how to harvest a crop, etc., etc., how to paint, how to do joinery, you know, how to do carpentry, how to... So there's just a big, big list of stuff that these people at the end of their seven years, and they, they've obviously been fed and they've been worked, and they should have been rested every seventh day <laughs> if, if, if they had a good slave owner. We very much doubt that. In some cases, they would have, you know, they'd have been a Sunday, they'd have been, went to church and just, uh, you know, that's how, that's how they learned the culture, you know. But thank God, they're the black Israelites now, praise God, <laughs> that, uh, you know, have their own uh, movement, and, and that's excellent. So we've read this part out. Historians have worked hard to explain the sudden rise of abolitionism in this juncture in history, some emphasize the impact of cultural change and the new Borgias cult of sensibility. Others suggest that abolitionism, albeit unwittingly served the interests of the new industrial capitalism. Well, it's just, see, that this is why I don't get because slavery is very much based on socialism. <laughs> you know... But to say that it benefited industrial capitalism, a lot of the slaves went and worked in factories, okay? They had no, pretty much their slave owner was, a, was the factory owner. Or the farm owner, or whatever that was. But uh, how, how they can say that this is capitalism is not... I mean, this, this is a form of socialism, actually. But, you know, so this is how people begin to hate capitalism. It's, it's, not, it's not a true form of capitalism. You know, laissez-faire capitalism is based on fair trade and is based on, um, you know, giving value and tra inter-trading between nations. You know, everything has a, has a correct value. But in these cases, they were, you know, they were just mistreated. The most recent analysis argues that the key lies in the anxieties and dislocations Created by the American Revolution, yet all agree that Quakers and Evangelicals played a central role in the abolitionist movement, though their success depended on building a, bo a broad coalition that included Whig and Tory politicians, Whig, I'm not sure what that is, Enlightenment rationalists, Romantic poets, and sympathetic journalists. Christian campaigners were not native, sorry, naive. Idealists and were not afraid to appeal to British interests. Clarkson wrote a major work on the impolicy uh, of the trade, and the evangelical James Stephen eventually persuaded Parliament that dismantling the Atlantic slave trade would undermine the colonial power of Britain's rivals, especially France. Uh, Hmm. Parliament abolished the trade in 1807. Again, seven, there you go. After abolitionists exploited an unpredictable and fort fortuitous conjuncture of um, 
political economic circumstances, but as David Bryan Davis noted, this political dimension should not obscure the crucial points. From 1770s onward, devout Quakers were always the backbone of active anti-slavery organization and communication. Uh, religion was that the centre concern of all the British abolitionist leaders' grassroots support came overwhelmingly from the dissenting churches, as Davis writes, the fall of the New World slavery could not have occurred if there had uh, been no abolitionist movements. This was a moral achievement that may have no parallel, may have no parallel. So they knew they were part of something during that time that was just uh, may not be repeated in history again. But it's up to this generation to get together and start to say, look, you know, we're not going to have our children being enslaved by the new uh, empire, worldwide religious empire, which is Islam, you know, or the old empire is actually, but anyhow. We're not going to allow our children to get enslaved by that. You know, So you've got to form groups, prayer groups. You've got to make these things known in your communities that we do not want our children to be raped and to be sold as slaves and to be used as prostitutes um, for, for Islam or any other um, religion or empire. So that's what you've got to do. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Shalom.